the action of withdrawing fellowship is certainly a, a sad occasion. And as a result, many congregations, very simply through the years, will not practice it and have not practiced it. It has, as a result, become known as the forgotten command, when in reality it was never forgotten, it would just not practiced. It was, should have been better identified as the ignored command, because many congregations through the years have simply ignored to do what the Bible teaches about it. Yet, the Bible is very clear as to the withdrawal of fellowship. It's not hard to understand. Is it hard to practice? Well, yes, it is, because it is such a sad occasion. But starting tonight, I want us to look at this command to withdraw fellowship. And without any question, the New Testament does command this type of discipline, church discipline. And so the very first point that we want to notice is that it is being done by divine authority. The songs that we sing tonight certainly tie in with that. The very first song, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Uh, this is being done in the name of the Lord. It is being done by divine authority. There are at least 68 different verses that relate directly to the subject of withdrawal of fellowship in the New Testament. And specifying a wide range of unrepented sins with which we are to deal. I want us to read together several of these passages, uh, one rather lengthy one and several others, and we will come back as we study through this subject to these passages along with dealing with some others, but these set the tone for the subject. The first one being Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 15 through 17. And I decided I would go ahead and read all of these instead of just referring to them and going on because I think it becomes, it is going to help impress upon our minds the need to do this and that it is being done by divine authority. In Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. Jesus states, Moreover, if thy brother tres shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that at the, in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and as a publican. Before we go to the next one, let me just uh, mention as a side note here that there are those who, so, who teach that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are simply dealing with Old Testament doctrine and they have no application for today. This passage shows... You know, it says, if he neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. Well, that's not the Old Testament. That's dealing with New Testament doctrine, not Old Testament doctrine. So this passage by itself disproves that uh, doctrine. The second passage we want to look at is Romans 16 and verse 17. And here Paul writes very simply, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. 
then going on to 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. The entire chapter deals with this subject, so I want to read all 13 verses of 1 Corinthians 5 where Paul writes that it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and am not rather mourn that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Next passage we want to read would be in Second Thessalonians, the third chapter. And there's two verses here, verse 6 and then verse 14. And here in St. Thessalonians 3, verse 6 says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that, with, that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Remember that song that we sang, the very first one, do all in the name of the Lord? Well, here it says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to do this. Then in verse 14 of St. Thessalonians 3, that if any, obey, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. <clears throat> The next passage we want to deal with would be 1 Timothy, the first chapter. And again, there's two passages in this first chapter that we want to read. The first of those would be verses 3 and 4, where he says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. <coughs> as, I, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to, to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Then skip down a few verses to verses 19 and verse 20, where he says, holding, fast, holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. <clears throat> then we turn over a few chapters, still in 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verses 20 and 21. <clears throat> when he says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called, 
which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. <clears throat> Again, as he writes his son in the faith, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 8 and verse 9, he says, Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. <clears throat> then in Titus, the first chapter, in dealing specifically with the responsibility of elders, we come down to verses 9 and verse 10 of Titus 1. And he says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. <clears throat> A couple of chapters later, still in writing to Titus, chapter 3, verses 10 and verse 11, he then says that a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Then one last passage, and certainly uh, these do not exhaust the list of passages that could be called upon that deal with the subject. But in 2 John, verses 9 through verse 11, John writes, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and Son. If, any, if, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth in God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. With these, we obviously see the need and the emphasis found within the Scripture for this act of withdrawal of fellowship. Even though it has been ignored through the years, it is the obligation of those who are members of the Lord's Church that when needed, it is to be exercised upon those individuals. And... Sadly, while we might ignore it and have ignored it through the years, we should not, and we do so at our own peril. So as we start studying this, after hopefully impressing upon our minds the Scripture's continued emphasis on the action of doing this, we first want to look at the specific sins for which we are to withdraw fellowship. The first of those would be doctrinal error. We read these verses just a moment ago, but again, I want to go ahead and emphasize them. In 1 Timothy 1, verses 19 and 20, he states, holding fast, or holding, holding faith, and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now then, Hymenaeus and Alexander made shipwreck of the faith. And as a result... Paul says, I have delivered them unto Satan. Well, we cannot fellowship those individuals who are delivered unto Satan. That would be the withdrawal of fellowship from that individual. Or in this case, Paul's withdrawal of fellowship and announcing it publicly of Hymenaeus and Alexander. 
and he wrote it down for generations to come, including us, that we know those two individuals. We know them by name, and we know that they made shipwreck of the faith, and we know that those two individuals were delivered unto Satan. Again, in Titus 1, verses 9 through verse 11, when he's dealing with the elders and their qualifications, that they are ones who are to be holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Now then he gets into the purpose of that, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And so here, the elders, as they have that obligation to hold fast to that faithful word, make sure that the doctrine that is being taught is right and true, that we do not deviate from God's Word. And elders are to be those individuals who are able to exhort and convince those individuals who would go astray. And then, those who are teaching things contrary to that faithful word, their mouths must be stopped. Elders have that obligation to make sure that people do not listen to those individuals and that those individuals cannot gain a foothold within the members of the congregation. Their mouths must be stopped. Otherwise, they will subvert houses, whole houses, by teaching things which they ought not. Then 2 John, verses 9 through verse 11, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bidding God's speed, for he that biddeth in God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Here is someone who does not abide in the doctrine of Christ. The word doctrine very simply means teaching, and it could have very rightly been translated here, teaching. But the question becomes, and what many individuals want to try to teach today, is that this phrase, doctrine of Christ, has reference to the doctrine about Christ. In verse 7, John mentions the uh, Gnostics in particular who deny that Jesus has come or that Christ has come in the flesh. These are Antichrist. Well, they thus then come to verse 9 and say this doctrine of Christ only refers to that doctrine uh, of verse 7 that he's talking about in relationship to the Gnostics of Christ coming in the flesh. And thus, the only ones that St. John 9 through 11 applies to is those individuals who would deny that Jesus is, or that Christ has come in the flesh. But in doing so, they ignore the overall context. If you go back at the very beginning, he talks about truth and how that individuals are walking in truth. He then changes the wording from truth to his commandments, the commandments of Christ. Or it could have been stated, Christ's commandments, or the commandments of Christ. Either way, the, the translation would be accurate. Just as verse 9 could accurately be translated either Christ doctrine or doctrine of Christ. Either way, it would be a proper translation. But you have first truth, then commandments. Now then, 
he uses in verse 7 one illustration of individuals who are not keeping the commandments because one of the problems of Gnosticism was that of licentiousness. They believe that since the body is evil, go ahead and let the body do whatever it wants to. It can engage in any sin and any wickedness and any abomination and your spirit can still be right with God. Now that was one form of Gnosticism of these individuals that deny that Christ has come in the flesh. But that's an illustration of individuals who are not keeping the commandments. He then uses, instead of the word uh, commandments or truth, then commandments, then he changes to use the word doctrine. But he's saying and using different terms that mean the same thing. And so he's dealing with that which Christ has taught, not the doctrine that deals with his deity, but everything that he is that originates from him. And when someone brings a doctrine that does not originate with God, then he does not have fellowship with God. And we cannot have fellowship with him. We must withdraw our fellowship from that individual. Why? Because he no longer has fellowship with God. <clears throat> but let me take a few minutes to look at this idea of doctrinal error. Because a lot of individuals start misunderstanding and misapplying this aspect. There are many doctrines that might be in error, but that are not worthy of withdrawing the fellowship. Now that may seem strange, but it, let's think about it and think things through. A doctrine is either true or false. Let me give an illustration in regards to how the Spirit dwells in the Christian. We have brethren who have, through the years, differed as to how the Spirit dwells in the Christian. Some of them say that the Spirit dwells representatively in the Christian. Others teach that the Spirit dwells personally within the Christian. For example, uh, for years, Brother Guy N. Woods and Brother Gus Nichols differed on that question. They did for their entirety of their lives. And as they would get to the open forum during the Freed Hardeman lectures, and that question would invariably come up, well, they would both present their views on it, and they would go on. They continued in fellowship. Both of them cannot be right. One of them is an error. Thus, how could they have fellowship? It was doctrinal error in that sense. Well, we'll get to that in a minute as to the answer to that. Because there are many things dealing with God's word in which we are going to differ in our understanding of it. I have a lot of good brethren, faithful brethren, who believe that the book of Revelation was written prior to A.D. 70. There are some good brethren who believe that there is a medium date between 70 and the late date, and then there's brethren who would take a late date of around 90 to 95 A.D. Guess what? They cannot all be right. It's an impossibility. It was written at a specific time, and those who teach the other time or date, well, guess what? They're in error. They're wrong. Should we withdraw fellowship from those individuals? 
because they are in error and it's dealing with the doctrine of the Bible? Well, of course not. Thus, should we come over to someone who teaches error? For example, James D. Bells, back uh, several years ago, wrote his book, Not Under Bondage, in which he advocated that those individuals who are not married to other members of the church, in other words, a Christian married to a Christian, that Matthew 19.9 did not apply to them. It applied only to Christians married to Christians and no one else. And thus, this person in the world, Matthew 19, 9, doesn't apply to them. They can divorce and remarry as many times as they want to. And only after they become a Christian does, do they come under that law of Christ. Well, that's wrong. It is an error. Should we continue to fellowship him? Well, some would say, and some did say, well, yes, continue to fellowship him. It's just like these other subjects. Those people, you know, Brother Woods and Brother Nichols, both of them cannot be right. One of them's right, one of them's wrong, yet they remain in fellowship. Why can't we remain in fellowship with him? Then you come, go back a little bit farther, and seeing also today, you had those who wanted to bring in the instrument of music into our worship. And so what did they do? Well, some of them brought it in over the objection of faithful brethren, but they said, why, this isn't something we should withdraw fellowship over. Was it wrong? Yes, it was wrong. But it's not a matter of fellowship. And so, coming more toward nowadays, you have individuals who wrote books, members of the church. For example, Bill Love wrote a book dealing with the bullseye gospel. Rubel Shelley wrote a book dealing with Big F, Little F Fellowship. Big F Fellowship and Little F Fellowship. And essentially, their teaching on this was that as long as they don't deny the doctrine or the deity of Christ, these other matters, and they would place instrumental music, premillennialism, the date of AD of Revelation, the indwelling of the Spirit. They had to place all of these other things in that category. Of, it doesn't deal with the deity of Christ, and so we can remain in fellowship one with another even though we disagree on those matters. And that's what you have today. Let me present to you, though, that when Paul, for example, there in 1 Timothy 1, verse 19 and 20, holding faith and a good conscience, when he's talking about holding faith, He's dealing with those matters that are dealing with salvation. When he talks about elders in Titus 1, holding fast the faithful word which hath been taught, he's dealing with matters of salvation. Now then, how do we apply that? Here's the doctrine of this how the Spirit dwells in us that Brother Nichols and Brother Woods disagreed over for years. Ask the question, if Brother Woods was right and Brother Nichols was wrong, how is that going to affect Brother Nichols' salvation? How is it going to affect his relationship with God as far as his obedience to the gospel and becoming a Christian, in living the Christian life, in worship to God? How is it going to affect that? It's not. If Brother Nichols was right and Brother Woods was wrong, again, how is that going to affect Brother Woods' relationship with God? 
as to how he became a Christian, his living a Christian life, his worship, any of those aspects, how is it going to affect that relationship with God? It's not. Thus, that is not a matter of the faith of which we can hope. And thus, we can have differences along those lines. The date of revelation. Whether one takes an early date, a medium date, or a late date. How is that going to affect our relationship with God? Whichever view one holds, how is it going to affect our obedience to the gospel in becoming a Christian? How is it going to affect our worship to God? How is it going to affect the church? How is it going to affect Christian living? It's not going to have any effect upon those things at all. And thus, those individuals remain in fellowship with God even though they might be wrong about that subject. And thus, we remain in fellowship one with another. But you get over here into changing the worship of the church. That's a different matter now. Once you alter that worship of the church, that worship must be done in spirit and in truth, John 4, 23 and 24. And we see from the very beginning of time with Cain and Abel that God does not accept all worship. It must be a worship that is acceptable to God or else you do not do right. You're doing wrong and you commit sin, and there's a separation between you and God when you worship incorrectly. And thus, when you bring an instrument of music into the worship assembly, you have altered your relationship with God. You no longer have that fellowship with God, and thus we cannot have continuing fellowship with those individuals. And so when you're dealing with we may times just in a broad way state doctrinal error, we need to understand that while there might be matters of doctrine that an individual is wrong about, if that matter does not affect his relationship with God, if it does not deal with his salvation as to how he became a Christian, how he lives the Christian life, the church and the worship of the church, the organization of the church, and all of those things that God has instituted, if it doesn't deal with those matters, then that's not the type of doctrinal error that we're talking about when we're talking about the need to withdraw fellowship. Notice the term that, uh, in, for example, in 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20, that here's these two, Hymenaeus and Alexander, they have made shipwreck of the faith. Shipwreck of the faith. In other words, they destroyed the faith. God's word. Now I'll go back to this illustration in relationship to how the spirit dwells in the Christian that Woods and Nichols disagreed on and that brethren today disagree on. How does either view right or wrong, make shipwreck of the faith. It doesn't. Notice that they may learn not to blaspheme. Does either one of those positions blaspheme? Absolutely not. If you look at Titus 1, 9 through 11, again, in verse 11, these mouths must be stopped. Why? Because they subvert whole houses. In other words, they're destroying the faith of individuals. And they thus are unruly, vain talkers, deceivers. They're pulling people away from the faith. These individuals are causing others to believe things that will cause that individual to be lost. And thus their mouth must be stopped. But a matter of indifference 
even though it's a matter of biblical subject, yet, being a matter of indifference, it's not going to affect their salvation. To use another illustration, one that uh, not too long ago, as we were studying through Matthew in the adult class, Matthew 26 and verse 39, in particular in Christ's prayer, I presented a view that probably no one here believed, at least at the time that I presented it, as to the prayer of Christ. Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not I, my will, but thine be done. Most brethren believe that Jesus prayed something that I don't believe that he prayed. What difference is it going to make in relationship to our salvation? Absolutely none. I could say the same thing about many people understandings that we have that differ with one another in relationship to salvation or the faith. And we then start understanding a little bit when we're talking about doctrinal error. An individual is not a false teacher in the biblical idea of a false teacher simply because he teaches something that is in error or that we may believe to be in error. You may still believe that I was in error in teaching what I did about Matthew 26, verse 39. That's fine. You have the right to be wrong on that subject because it's not going to affect our salvation. And there's a lot of subjects likened to that. Even though they're Bible subjects, they're not going to affect our salvation, whatever one believes about them. And thus, those individuals are not false teachers. False teachers are those individuals who are teaching doctrines that would cause an individual to be lost. If I believe that doctrine, and I act upon that doctrine, then it's going to cause me to lose my fellowship with God. That individual is a false teacher. And that is the individual that must be withdrawn from. So the first category, as far as sins that we must withdraw from, are those who teach doctrinal error, but understanding that doctrinal error is that error that is of such a nature that will cause one to be lost. That also guards against us going overboard and just withdrawing fellowship from anyone and everyone that comes along as well. As long as these matters are matters of option, that they are matters of indifference, we're not to withdraw from them. Now, if they, there's other things that they might get into that might cause them to be withdrawn from, but that doctrine that does not affect salvation is not something over which we withdraw fellowship. I'm going to end at this point this evening because of time, but uh, we must look at the scriptures, and we must determine what is a matter of salvation and what God teaches in relationship to our salvation, both in becoming a Christian, that we must, and scriptures teach that we must believe, that we must repent, that we must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. The Bible teaches that very clearly and distinctly. For what purpose? For the purpose of salvation, for the purpose of the remission of sins. That's the purpose that God gives. Now, if I try and change that or alter it, I'm going to affect that individual's, if they believe it and act upon it, their eternal salvation and cause them to be lost. 
but also in living the Christian life. The Bible teaches us how to live the Christian life and how thus in our life to continue to remain acceptable to God. Now, if I teach something that's going to cause someone to live in such a way that would cause them to be lost. And I'll go back to the illustration that I uh, used in relationship to James Bales and his, the doctrine that he taught concerning marriage, divorce, and remarriage. If someone believed that and acted upon it, they would live in adultery. And adultery is going to cause them to be lost. Thus, he was a false teacher that needed to be marked and withdrawn from because of doctrinal error. But the Bible is teaching us how to live and how to remain in, a, in an acceptable relationship with God and thus in fellowship with him. Now, if you've not obeyed the gospel to become a Christian, then you're not in fellowship with God and you need to become such this evening. If you haven't lived in the way that God has instructed us to live within the pages of the Bible, then you need to repent and turn back into that truth and live so that you can have that relationship with God, be in fellowship with Him, and thus have heaven as your home. Now, if you need to come this evening to enjoy that salvation, then why not come as we stand and sing the invitation song?